Hello everyone, my name is Anna and today we're talking about how to understand native English speakers. So my first question to you, and I want you to write your answer in the comments, is why are native English speakers hard to understand? So what is it about native English speakers that you find difficult to understand? If you think you know the answer to that, put it in the comments. And I'm going to be sharing some slides with you as well, so let me bring those up. Okay, so under understanding native English speakers is what we're discussing today. And in today's lesson, um, we're going to be looking at the listener's point of view, so your point of view. And we're going to look at why native speakers speak so fast. And then we'll look at some steps to understanding native speakers. Okay. So, imagine you're having a discussion with a native speaker. Now, if you've clicked on this video, it's probably because you find native speakers hard to understand. And when you are speaking to a native, you probably feel like you are out of your comfort zone. Have you heard the phrase comfort zone before? So your comfort zone, zone is uh, another word for an area, a specific area. <clears throat> and your comfort zone is the area in which you feel safe and comfortable. It's a familiar space. Now this could be a physical space, but we tend to use it for activities and events, situations. So in which situations do you feel most comfortable? I feel quite comfortable in my office speaking to you, my audience. This is my comfort zone. I have experience with it. I'm familiar with it. But if you put me on a different stage, talking about a different topic to an audience I don't know, then I would probably be outside of my comfort zone. I would feel uncomfortable, okay? I'd feel a bit vulnerable, perhaps. So if you're speaking to a native speaker and you're struggling to understand, you possibly feel like you're out of your comfort zone. Let me know if that's you. You might also feel anxious, apprehensive, or panic-stricken. Panic-stricken. Now, you might notice what I'm trying to do here, as well as talking about this particular topic, is I want you to learn some new vocabulary, all right? So I'm trying to use phrases and words that are either slightly more advanced or the common things that we that we use. So for example, your comfort zone, to be in your comfort zone or to be out of your comfort zone, this is a very common phrase that I think you should know. So do make a note of these new words and phrases in your notebook. So anxious, apprehensive, panic stricken. Essentially, these all mean to be worried. So when you speak with a native speaker, you might feel a bit worried. But there's a slight difference between all of these little words that I've written. And when you hear the meanings, I want you to decide which of the three is more representative of you and how you feel with native speakers. So to be anxious. To be anxious simply is a synonym of worried. I feel worried, I feel anxious. These are the same, the same word essentially. Anxious, anxious. Apprehensive also means worried, but with a sense of perhaps holding back, pulling back, perhaps even canceling something because you're worried. So if I feel a little bit apprehensive about going to a meeting, I might consider not going to the meeting because I'm a bit apprehensive, okay? I'm a bit nervous about actually doing it. 
So there's that slight difference there. Panic stricken means you are struck with panic. To panic is when everything just becomes uncontrollable. You might lose control of your breathing. You might not be able to think straight and you're panicking. Maybe you act irrationally because you are panicking. Worry has, has gotten the better of you. OK, so when you speak with a native English speaker, are you simply anxious, <laughs> apprehensive <gasps> or panic stricken? <laughs> OK, so it's almost like different levels, low level anxiety, worried, apprehensive. I might pull out panic stricken. Which of the three do you feel when you speak with a native speaker? OK. You might also feel when you're in a group of native speakers, you might feel excluded, excluded. Exclude is like the opposite of include. If you are included in a group discussion, then you are a part of that discussion. You feel like you are contributing to that discussion. And you can take things away from that discussion. You can learn things. You understand everything that's going on. But if you feel excluded, even if you are in the circle with a group of people talking, if you don't understand what they're saying, you might feel like you're just being shut out. Like you just don't know what's going on. If they start laughing, maybe they're all sharing a joke and you heard the words, but you just didn't understand the joke and they're all laughing, but you are just, <laughs> what? You feel like you've missed out on something. You've missed the joke. And that can feel quite awkward, can't it? Then if it comes back to you at a point in the conversation where you're not following what's going on, then you feel like someone has put you on the spot. To be put on the spot is to be expected to give an answer when you feel like you aren't ready. You haven't understood what's gone on. You don't know what to say and you might feel even more embarrassed. Okay, <clears throat> so have you ever felt any of these things? out of your comfort zone, an anxious, apprehensive, panic stricken? Have you ever felt excluded? Like you didn't fit in? Have you ever felt like you've missed out on the social aspect? At work, perhaps everyone's having a good time going out for drinks, but you just sit there completely blank, not understanding what's going on. OK, well, if you feel any of these things, I'm sure you can tell from the comments that you are not alone. And I know what you want. What you want to feel is like understanding English is a breeze. Understanding English speakers is a breeze. What does in a, is a breeze mean? English, understanding English is a breeze. Well, I could say instead, understanding English is a walk in the park. Oh, what does that mean? Understanding English is as easy as pie. Or understanding English is a cinch. Now I'm going to put all of these words on screen for you. So you can see this. All of these phrases mean that um, it's effortless. It's easy. Can you think of any other ways to say that something is really easy? And this is what you want. You want to be able to walk into a conversation with a native speaker and you want to feel effortless in your communication. You want to understand every word, regardless of accent, regardless of dialect, regardless of whether it's formal English or informal English. If it's a discussion at your local shop with the shopkeeper or with your neighbor or with your boss, you want every interaction to be as easy as pie, a cinch. OK, 
okay? That is what you want. You want to take away the barrier that English has become. And that is achievable, I promise you. Now, I asked you why you think native English speakers are hard to understand. In many cases, students feel like English speakers speak too fast. But speed is not the culprit. Speed is not the culprit. Are you familiar with the word culprit? If not, don't worry, because it's not a very common word. So let me put it on screen for you here. Culprit means a person <clears throat> who is responsible for a crime or a misdeed. So the baddie, the person responsible for whatever bad thing has happened. Uh, obviously, I'm personifying speed here. So speed is not the culprit. Speed is not the reason that you're struggling to understand native speakers, essentially. So what is? What is the problem? Well, let me just bring my face up a little bigger here. Hi. <laughs> well, the problem is more that you are just not used to the sounds of English. Can you remember when you were learning how to drive? I just about can remember. It wasn't that long ago. <laughs> it was quite a while, but not that long ago. When I first got into the driving seat of a car and put my foot on the accelerator and started driving down the road at 10 miles an hour, I was terrified. On a public road with other road users and pedestrians, me in the car believing that I was now in control of something that could damage or kill someone or damage property, 10 miles an hour felt so fast because I was not familiar with how to control the car. I was not familiar enough with the roads. And so 10 miles an hour felt really, really fast. But the speed, it wasn't the problem. It was the fact that I wasn't familiar with the car, how the car worked and the road in which I was operating on. Then after 10 or 20 lessons, in fact, I passed my test after 20 lessons, if I remember correctly. I did my test really, really quickly. And I felt like by that point, 30 miles an hour felt great, comfortable. It didn't feel fast. 30 miles an hour was a good speed. I could enjoy driving, looking around, seeing what was going on, having a conversation with the passenger because driving at 30 miles an hour had become second nature. Then after I passed my test, I drove on the motorway for the first time because you're not allowed to drive on the motorway when you're learning how to drive. And suddenly I went from driving at 30 miles an hour to driving at 70 miles an hour. And again, I was terrified. Even though the road was straight, I, I did it in the middle of the day. So there weren't many cars on the road. 70 miles an hour was terrifying to me. And even now, you get the point. The point I'm trying to make is familiarity makes speed seem more or less scary, more or less of an issue. Sometimes now as a very experienced driver of 20 odd years, sometimes I feel like 70 miles an hour is too slow because I have an open road to drive on. But other times, 70 miles, 60 miles, even 50 miles an hour feels too fast if the lanes are narrow, I'm very close to the barrier and there are lots and lots of cars on the road. It feels a bit too much. So speed itself essentially is not the problem, it's your familiarity with the materials, the language. If you're not used to the sounds, the accent you're hearing, the words, how the words fit together. That's what we need to look at, okay? So, if you are a driver, by the way, <laughs> do put your hand up and say, I drive. 
Uh, do you drive too fast? Hopefully not. Um, okay, so what is the problem? One of the problems that native speakers present is that they use vocabulary that is essentially quite difficult. So it's not just the standard vocabulary that you're learning in the average classroom. We use in British English a lot of phrasal verbs. Can anyone give me an example of a phrasal verb? Maybe your favorite phrasal verb. Here's an example that I can give you. So to back out, to back out. Now, um, to back out, it to, to go backwards out of something. Physically, if you reverse out of something, you back out of something, that's not a phrasal verb. That's I'm going backwards out of this place. So if I, in my car, back out of the garage, it's very easy to understand what's happening. I'm going backwards out of the garage, to back out of the garage. But if I say to you, I'm going to back out of this deal, or I've agreed to organize a party, but I'm gonna have to back out, it means I'm going to have to give up my responsibility here. I'm going to, I'm no longer going to be a part of this. Okay, so phrasal verbs have very specific individual meanings and they don't have a blanket rule to allow you to learn lots of phrasal verbs under one rule. You have to learn each individual phrasal verb and how it's used. And in a lot of cases, there are multiple meanings for each phrasal verb. That's why that's difficult. <clears throat> Another phrase of verb that I like, that I like, that I've written down <laughs> is break up. To break up. To break up in a relationship means for the relationship to fall apart. So there's another one. The relationship no longer continues. So if you break up with your partner, your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your wife, your husband, then you are stopping the relationship. You no longer want to be in that relationship. You break up the relationship. Okay. Um, phrasal verbs are not the only aspect of vocabulary that's tricky. We also, in British English, love an idiom. Okay. So if you think that ignoring idioms is okay, then you are barking up the wrong tree. And barking up the wrong tree is an idiom, an example of an idiom. Again, it's a phrase that on its own doesn't make sense. But um, once you know the meaning, then it becomes, it's more like a picture. Once you know the meaning, it makes sense. Imagine a dog is chasing the cat. The cat is what, is what it wants. And it goes to the wrong tree. The cat's up this tree, but the dog goes to that tree and it's barking. When you say to the dog, hey, the cat's in the other tree. You are barking up the wrong tree. So if you come to me and you start shouting at me and say, I can't believe you did this, blah, 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 blah. And you're having a go at me for something I didn't do. I'd say, look, you are barking up the wrong tree. I'm not the culprit here. In fact, it was your sister who is to blame for this terrible situation. You're barking up the wrong tree. Okay. So that's an idiom. And we've talked about phrasal verbs. Now I'm going to give you uh, an example of something a native might say, and it's full of idiomatic language. Hopefully I've not made any typos here, but let me bring it up. Have you clocked my other half yet? He's such a dish. Oh, he's a gent. I mean, I'm massively punching, to be honest, but he's really into me. And well, let's just say he's a keeper. Now, let me know if you find what I just said is easy to understand. Is it easy? Can you read it now and think, oh yeah, I'm following exactly what Anna meant in everything she just said, or is it difficult to understand? 
in that particular phrase, there are one, two, three, four ish, five, six, seven, I'd say seven aspects that are pretty difficult to understand if you don't know the set phrases. So let me point out some of them. Have you clocked my other half yet? To clock someone is to, we talk about clocking eyes on someone. I'm not quite sure of the origin of the meaning to clock, but to clock eyes on someone is to see someone. It's like to spot. Have you spotted them yet? So I'm saying, have you seen my other half yet? My other half is another phrase for my partner, my boyfriend, my girlfriend. It, it doesn't um, specify gender. It's just your partner, my other half. Have you clocked my other half yet? Now, the reason that idioms are important to learn is because often we do shorten them. So they are hard to understand if you don't know them anyway, but then we shorten them, which makes it even harder to understand. So have you clocked should be, have you clocked eyes on my other half yet? So I'm asking, have you seen my partner yet? He's such a dish. A dish means he's dishy. To describe someone as dishy is to say they are gorgeous, almost like they are delicious. Mm, 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 yummy. What a gorgeous person that is. So he's such a dish. We've shortened it right down. He's such a, di a dish and a gent. So in saying he's a dish, I'm talking about his looks, his appearance. He's gorgeous. Then I say he's a gent, which is short for gentleman, which means he behaves in a very considerate and kind way towards me. So he's a gentleman. He is polite. He's kind. He's considerate. So he's gorgeous and he's got a lovely, considerate personality. And then I use a filler. I mean, I'm massively punching, to be honest. Again, I've shortened an idiom to be punching above your weight. We use this um, often when talking about relationships. If you feel like one person is, how do you describe this? If you feel like someone is with someone that they are not deserving of, um, it's often quite shallow actually, because it often refers to just their looks which is not something that is high on my priority list. But in many cases, people feel like if someone is with someone else, they should be equal in their levels of attractiveness. So if you say he is punching well above his weight, it's like imagining two boxers in the fighting ring. They have to be matched on weight, which is why you have the different like classes. You have featherweight. I don't know if they call it a league or a class in boxing, but you have the featherweights and then you have the heavyweights and there's other weight classes. I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a, a big boxing person, but they are matched on weight. So if two people who are dating are not matched in terms of looks, then you'd say that one is punching way above, you know, that where they should be. So if I say I'm punching, I'm saying he's really, really attractive, far too attractive for me. So I'm very lucky to have someone as attractive as him. He doesn't match my level of attractiveness. So I say I am massively punching, to be honest. He's so much more attractive than me. But, and I move on here, but he's really into me. Now, this is more like slang to be into someone just means that you are very passionate and very keen and eager to do, eat, be with, whatever it is, you're very interested in it. So I'm really into red wine, it means I'm very interested in drinking and enjoying and understanding 
about red wine. Um, I'm really into the crown at the moment. It means I'm enjoying and quite passionate about watching this particular series, The Crown. You can be into a person, like in this example, it means you're very um, interested in that person. There's even a film that's called He's Just Not That Into You or something like that. So he's really into me. And well, let's just say he's a keeper. If someone is a keeper, I'm not talking about a goalkeeper. I'm not talking about football. I mean, he's good enough to keep. I want to try and marry this person because he's amazing. He's a keeper, one that you keep forever. So now you understand all of those little idiomatic features. It should be easier when I say, have you clocked my other half yet? He's such a dish. And a gent, I mean, I'm massively punching, to be honest, but he's really into me. And well, let's just say he's a keeper. Okay, so hopefully now that makes a little bit more sense. So let me go back to my notes and show you. Um, the next thing on the list, the other reason why natives are not that easy to understand. So it's not just about vocabulary. It's also about pronunciation. Now, there are many regional varieties of English, English pronunciation within the UK alone. Can anyone name a regional British accent for me? Just pop it in the comments, a regional British accent. Um, I changed my accent, actually. I used to have a very strong regional accent, but now I speak with RP, received pronunciation. OK, so <clears throat> pronunciation is an issue because there are so many varieties. And in lots of cases, many students don't even have a basic foundation, a central point of reference for British English pronunciation. So your central point of reference, like the learning pronunciation is received pronunciation, RP. The variation that you find written in the dictionaries, um, the variation which I use, it's like your base, and once you understand the base, that's your central point of reference, it's much easier then to go out and understand regional varieties. OK, so, yes, we have regional varieties like Cockney, which is what a London accent. We have um, many varieties of Irish. There are also different versions of Welsh accents and Scottish accents as well, like Glaswegian. Um, an Edinburgh accent. Yes, we have a, a Birmingham accent, otherwise known as a Brummy accent. We have the Scouse accent, the Liverpool accent. And I think overall, if I remember the number correctly, it's about 44 varieties of, of accents within the UK alone, which is just, it's crazy. There are so many and we are such a small place. So it's understandable that it's hard to understand natives when you have such variety. You have to tune in to all these different variations. OK, um, the other problem is that in some languages you don't have the same sounds. So there are some sounds in our language and it's the same for all languages. We don't all have exactly the same sounds. So there are some, some sounds that we have that you might not have in your language. So you're not used to hearing it. But once you become familiar with it, like driving down the motorway, it suddenly becomes much easier to hear and then understand. OK. Right. Next. Why else are natives difficult to understand? Connected speech. So you guys spend your time learning vocabulary, pronunciation, and then a native speaker goes and squashes all of those words together and squashes the phrases together. We contract words. 
we take away sounds, we add in sounds, and we connect them in a way that changes them, making it really hard for you. So can you see my points here? The problem isn't you. It's it's <laughs> it's the language, it's the sounds, and it's the way that natives treat the sounds. The reason we use these features of connected speech is simply to make delivery easy. So it's good to become familiar with connected speech, but it's something that naturally happens when you become familiar um, with the language, with the words, and start allowing the words to flow. Connected speech is a very natural thing that with practice should just happen. If you have the right base of pronunciation, with practice, connected speech just happens. No one taught us, native speakers, no one taught us how to connect our words. It just naturally started to happen. So one aspect of connected speech, for example, is when we drop the T. Now, this isn't something you should try to do. You shouldn't try to drop the T because actually, in many cases, you need the T. But dropping the T is a natural feature of connected speech. For example, when you say, I want to, want, the T, um, well, the double T, just gets dropped. Wanna, it becomes wanna. I wanna, I wanna, what do you wanna do? What do you wanna do? And you see there, I said, what do you want to do? But I said, and that should be a question mark, I do apologize. What do you want to do? Three T's, what do you want to do? Make it easy. What do you, what do you wanna, what do you wanna do? What do you wanna do? What do you wanna do? You see, it just all smooths together and blends to make this completely different sound. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Um, yes, lemme, lemme instead of let me. That's a that's a good example there. Thank you. Uh, I if I said I want to get the cat from the car, I want to get the cat from the car because the cat's in the car. Maybe we've visited the vet. I would say. I want to get, actually, I wouldn't say I want to get the cat from the car. I drop, I want to get, and I drop the T there as well. I want to get the cat, and I would say T there, from the car. I want to get the cat from the car. That's what I want to do. Okay. So there are examples. Um, there are times when T isn't dropped. So I don't want you to try to drop the T but it's good to be aware that that happens, okay, when you're listening so you know. Uh, so what else happens? Well, we have, um, oh, don't know is another one, don't know, don't know, that's a really good one. It almost sounds like a completely different word. I don't know just becomes don't know, don't know, okay. Right, so next, another reason natives are hard to understand is weak forms weak forms. Have you heard of weak forms before? So weak forms, some words have a weak and a strong form. This is why when you look at an English dictionary, a British English dictionary, you may see two different phonetic transcriptions next to a word. Um, when it says British English, two transcriptions, then it might say US and another transcription again. It's possibly because there is a weak form and a strong form, and it's showing you both forms in the transcript, in the phonetic transcript. And so, for example, um, of is a good example. Of, O-F, of. As a weak form, it becomes of, of. And we weaken it to help the flow. So, for example, if I were to say a piece of cake, a piece of cake, a piece of cake. It's a little bit too much to say of each time. A piece of cake, please. It slows me down. If I say of, piece of, piece of 
cake, piece of cake, a piece of cake. I'd like a piece of cake, please. Oh, that was a piece of cake, which is another idiom to mean easy. It was a piece of cake. A cup of tea, probably one of the most common phrases in the UK. A cup of tea, not of tea, of tea. A cup of tea, a cup of tea, please. Or a cuppa, which is even shorter. A cuppa, I just have a cuppa, thanks. So that's one. Um, we also have, well, there's lots of words you can shorten or become, make weak. For example, can you becomes can you? Can you? Can you? Uh, for example, let me put this in for you. Can you? Can you grab me a cup of tea? Can you? Can you grab me a piece of cake? Can you grab me a piece of cake? Can you grab me a piece of cake and a cup of tea? And a uh, is another one. And uh, becomes Anna. Anna. We drop the D. Anna. And a, a piece of cake and a cup of tea. A piece of cake and a cup of tea. Can you grab me a piece of cake and a cup of tea? Can you grab me a piece of cake and a cup of tea? Thanks. So you see how it just all starts to blend together. And that's why it sounds like we're speaking fast. It's because we're blending and using weak forms. Okay, so... The next reason why natives are hard to understand, cultural references. So what is a cultural reference? A cultural reference in language is something that only would make sense to you if you are familiar with popular culture. Things like popular TV programs, films, uh, celebrity news, um, potentially also things like iconic buildings and places, scandals, politi political news, anything that's happening within our culture, within our society, we might reference it in language in a slightly different way that then makes sense because of the reference. But if you don't know the reference, then it's just complete gobbledygook gobbledygook is probably one of my favorite words. It means nonsense, gobbledygook. I love it. So what is an example of a cultural reference? Well, let's imagine you say, Anna, come and look at my new kitchen. We've just had an extension built on the back of our house. We've made it into a big kitchen. Come and take a look. And I walk through the door and I say, wow, it's like a TARDIS. What could I mean? It's like a TARDIS. Well, you would understand what I meant by it's like a TARDIS if you are a fan of Doctor Who. Are there any Doctor Who fans watching today? Just comment Doctor Who. Oh yeah, if you are a fan of Doctor Who. Well, in Doctor Who, they travel around in what looks like an old police phone box and they call it a TARDIS. On the outside, it's this tiny little box that ha only has room for one person to stand in. But on the inside, as they open the door, this is a TV program, as the, as the actors, the characters open the door into the TARDIS, it's disproportionate. Inside, it's this huge room. It's huge, but on the outside, it looks small. And sometimes this does actually happen in life, doesn't it? A house or a building might look tiny on the outside. And then when you open the doors and you go in, you're like, whoa, it opens out into this huge space. You're like, That's surprising. It's like a TARDIS in here. It's like a TARDIS in here. So I'm only referencing the room. I'm not talking about Doctor Who. I'm talking about the room, but I'm talking about the effect of it looking small on the outside, but actually in reality, it being huge on the inside. And I use the cultural reference of Doctor Who. It's like a TARDIS in here, okay? So that's one cultural reference. Another one is a, a common phrase that we use for comic effect. 
And it's from a show called, a TV show called The Fast Show. And the phrase is, I'll get me coat. Not, I'll get my coat. Often in regional dialects, in many regional dialects, native speakers will change my for me because it flows, it's quicker. Me coat, I'll get me coat, I'll get me coat. And this, this phrase became popular in the popular show, The Far Show, as um, something you say when a situation is awkward, you know, and you want to back out <laughs> physically, you want to back out of the situation because it's awkward. Maybe you said something that made everyone go silent and you don't know what to do, you're embarrassed. And so what you do instead of feeling embarrassed is you say, I'll get my coat or rather I'll get me coat. I'll get me coat. <laughs> or you can just do taxi. That's another one. But I'll get me coat. Suggesting you're going to leave, but you're not really going to leave. And by saying that people will know of it because of the fast show and people laugh. They go, oh, yes, you're acknowledging, acknowledging the fact that the situation is awkward. And it breaks the ice. There's another idiom to break the ice when something is tense. A situation is tense and people don't know what to say. You, ha you have to give an icebreaker something that breaks the tension. OK, so that's used in an awkward situation. Um, another one which is getting a little old now and might not be around for much longer, but people of my age and older will still understand this reference and it's you've been tangoed does that make sense to anyone if i say oh i saw barbara today she looked like she'd been tangoed this refers to an advert that was advertising the popular fizzy drink tango and there's an orange tango i think now there's an apple tango if that actually still exists actually it might not be I don't know if I've seen it in the shops lately, but tango is like a fizzy pop and it's very orange. Okay. So they had these adverts where these people were like the tango orange. They would and, and they'd say, oh, you look like you've been tangoed because these people dressed as huge oranges would come up and like attack, like slapping and doing crazy things to this person in the street who would be like, shocked by this attack of big tango oranges and they'd be very orange and shocked and so now if you say to someone you look like you've been tangoed you're suggesting that they've had a fake tan that that is very orange they've overdone their tan um, or maybe you could even say if I was wearing a lot of bright orange like I am but maybe I was doing the full outfit in bright orange so I had maybe a bright orange headband and bright orange trousers and bright orange socks you'd say Anna you look like you've been tangoed so that is a cultural reference I would understand what you were talking about you were saying I look crazy orange right so there's some examples of cultural references for you which it's not easy to get up to speed with cultural references other than to start consuming popular British TV shows, paying attention to, you know, common news, like just the mainstream news to know what's going on. Um, yeah, and that's, that's how you deal with cultural references. So next, Another reason it's hard to understand natives is because our humour is different. Humour is different in every country. In, in the UK, we are quite a sarcastic nation. We like to say things that we don't mean for humorous effect. For example, if you see me in a park having a picnic and it's raining heavily, and you say, are you enjoying yourself? And I look at you and say, I'm having a wonderful time. Then I'm being sarcastic. I, I'm saying that I'm having a wonderful time, even though it's evident that I'm not. And that is an element of British humour, to just be sarcastic. Or perhaps if you 
perhaps if you've shaved your head, uh, you've shaved your head and you're completely bald, I look at you and say, oh, you've had a, you've had a, a trim. You obviously haven't had a trim. You've had it all shaved off. I'm being sarcastic. I'm saying something that's not true, making a comment about your hair. So sarcasm is saying one thing, but meaning another. We also like to like, understate things. So if it is raining very heavily at my picnic, it's torrential rain. We've got flash flooding everywhere. The rain is so heavy. And if I turn to you and say, it's raining a little bit, isn't it? That's an understatement. I'm saying that because I want to make comic effect. I want to create comic, comic effect. We are also a nation of innuendo lovers. And when I talk about innuendo, I mean sexual innuendo. To understand innuendo, British humour, you need to watch the Carry On films. They are full of innuendo. An example of innuendo Again, it's saying something, but meaning something a bit cheeky, sexual. So I might say, uh, for example, in the Carry On films, there was a character that Barbara Windsor, the, the actress playing this character, Barbara Windsor, she had um, quite large breasts. And there were always comments and innuendos, jokes about her having large breasts. And so you'd hear something like if she was holding some melons at a fruit stall and another character would say something like, oh, she's got a lovely pair of melons. On the face of it, talking about the melons, but underlying, actually talking about her large breasts. Okay, so that's innuendo. And if you watch the Carry On films, you'll completely understand what I'm talking about. Now, humour is a huge subject, but the last thing I'm going to mention is puns, because they are all over any written articles and the newspapers. So if you are reading the news to learn English or reading any articles online, you are going to find puns and they might confuse you. A pun is a play on words. It's intended to have comic effect, but it's not always like hilariously funny. An example of a pun is this funny little joke that I found today. I'll share it with you. I'm glad I know sign language. It's pretty handy. <laughs> okay, so sign language is where you use your hands to make signs to, to sign. Yeah, so... Um, Obviously, I'm using my hands to, to communicate this language. I use hand gestures. So I say, I'm glad I know sign language. It's pretty handy. Handy is a synonym of useful. So it is useful to know sign language. But I'm using a word that includes hand because you're using your hands. I'm saying it's handy. Okay, so there's that play on words. Another one is, uh, let me just make that capital. Don't try to write with a broken pencil, it's pointless. Or I could have said it's pointless trying to write with a broken pencil. It wouldn't have had the same effect. But don't try to write with a, point, a broken pencil, it's pointless. We often talk about the point of a pencil. So the very end of a pencil, the lead that actually makes the marks, if the lead has broken, then there's no point on your pencil. It's blunt and you'll need to sharpen your pencil to get a nice sharp point again. Don't try to write with a broken pencil. It's pointless. So it literally has no point. But also pointless means there's no reason to do it. It's, it's a silly thing to do. There's no reason. There's no point. A broken pencil won't work. So using pointless instead of it's a waste of time, which is another common phrase that we use, that I'm using that because it's a pun. It's a play on words. It's pointless. All right. Hopefully that helps. OK, so we've gone through these reasons as to 
why it's hard to understand native speakers because of the vocabulary, because of pronunciation, because we connect our speech in a, in a way that you're not used to. We use weak forms, which aren't always taught. We use cultural references that you'll only know if you become familiar with the culture. And our humor is different. So what can we do to fix this problem? How can we start to feel in control? Well, we need to take four steps and there's lots of other steps that you can take, but this is my suggestion to you. This is something I think that will help you straight away. So the first step, da -da 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 -da, drum roll, is work on your pronunciation. Work on your pronunciation to help you to understand native speakers. But Anna, that sounds so like counterintuitive. Counterintuitive means like against what you naturally think is the right thing to do. So that seems counterintuitive. How does working on my pronunciation help me understand other people and their pronunciation? Well, this comes down to having that strong, solid foundation of understanding what the sounds should be. The basic knowledge of English pronunciation. From that foundation, you can then start to learn and understand the variations. And this is why you'll see in the picture, I've put a little house on rocky foundations. Without a strong foundation, that house will not be a strong house. It will probably move quite a lot and it might even crumble and fall down. Okay, so work on your pronunciation. And also having that solid foundation helps you to be more relaxed once you do get into a conversation with a native speaker, because you'll start to recognize the sounds in others when they're speaking. Okay. Um, I've actually had it um, from one of my students saying that learning, like specifically learning the IPA, all the individual sounds and learning the alphabet, the IPA, the uh, International Phonetic, <laughs> put my teeth back in, the International Phonetic Alphabet, actually learning the International Phonetic Alphabet made a big difference on their pronunciation and then also on their listening skills. So really do focus on your own pronunciation first. What's the next step? Learn common phrasal verbs and idioms. Okay, so do focus on it. I've heard people, I've heard teachers even saying it's not such a big deal don't worry about learning phrasal verbs and, and idioms. We don't use them that much, but we do. We do. We use them sometimes in a way that's broken down into single words, as you saw previously in this lesson. So some natives might not even be aware that they're using idioms. They might not be aware how many times they use phrasal verbs, but they are so important to help you to speak fluently with native speakers and to understand what they're saying. So when you're planning your weekly study, you need to carve out time to specifically focus on pulling out common phrasal verbs and idioms, okay? What do we do next? We need to step outside of our comfort zone. So remember at the beginning, I talked about this comfort zone, this area in which you feel comfortable, maybe with someone like me, speaking relatively clearly, slowly. This is lovely. You might be able to understand me. But what you need to do is also start listening to other people, having conversations with other people. Even if it's scary, you have to keep putting yourself into that situation. Now, when you are in that situation, I want you to really, really focus on this now. Don't focus on individual words. Um, I've had it when I've been learning languages too, that you're listening, you're following a conversation in your target language, and then suddenly there's a word that you don't know. 
and you stop listening, but the conversation keeps going and you're just thinking about that word, trying to think, oh, what does that mean? And you start trying to make a mental note of that word or searching your memory, trying to find that word. And all that time you spent doing that, you've now lost the thread. You've lost the thread of the conversation. You no longer know what they're talking about, what's being said in that time when you were thinking about that one word. Now, I'm going to let you into a secret. There are many words that even I now, as a, 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 an English teacher in my 40s, there are words that I hear that I don't understand. Mostly it's when I'm watching things like politics or something very specific, like something about um, uh, geodemographics or something, you know, a specific topic, a, a specific subject matter that I'm not that familiar with. And there'll be words that I don't understand, but I don't get caught up in worrying about that individual word. I continue to listen to the overall conversation, the overall speech. I listen to the context for clues. I start to get an idea of what I think the word means. If it bothered me that much, then, you know, I can find it out later, but don't get caught up on individual words. Look at the overall meaning. Now, another thing you can do when you are stepping out of your comfort zone is to make sure that you're mixing passive listening. So, you know, long long periods of time listening to podcasts, listening to, um, you know, someone like me chatting away. But also you need to do some focused, active listening. So take a short clip of something and break it down, slow it down. Did you know that most videos on YouTube and other platforms, you can slow down the speed? You just need to go to the settings in the corner of the video not right this second, right now, if you're watching live, you can't slow me down. But you can slow down any video to, you can speed it up. I speed them up usually because I'm short on time, but you can slow them right down. So you can listen to it slowly, pick out the words that you're unfamiliar with, then start to shadow. And this is how, by actively practicing your listening and, and learning, by shadowing, this is how you're going to improve overall. Now, the final tip for you today is to ask for clarification. I cannot stress enough that if you are interacting with native British English speakers, you're in the UK or you're um, connected online, it is not in our nature to offer corrections. It's, it's just not what we do. It, for us, it's rude to point out when someone's made a mistake. Um, so if you're struggling with your English, we will help you to complete a sentence. If you can't find the word and you're saying the, uh, 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 then we jump in and offer the word that we think you're trying to find. But if you say something completely wrong, we will know in our head, but we won't say anything. So you have to ask. If someone says something that you just don't get, someone just went, oh, I'll get me coat. And everyone laughs in the room and you're looking around saying, why is everyone laughing? Because you said you'd get your coat, but you didn't get your coat. I don't understand. Then just say, what, what did that mean? You said you'd get your coat and everyone laughed. Don't be afraid to ask for help. Once a native that you're in regular contact with knows that you want to be corrected or you, that you want clarification, they're more likely to offer the help more naturally in future or they're more likely to slow down and to make things nice and simple for you, okay? So always ask for clarification. Okay, so there are your four steps to improving your listening skills when it comes to dealing with native speakers. Work on your pronunciation. Learn those common phrasal verbs and idioms. Take yourself out of your comfort zone. Being there is not going to help you. So get out of that comfort zone. You will enjoy it, I promise. And if you do get stuck, then ask for help. 
ask for clarification. Thank you everyone for joining me today. I do hope you found that useful. Don't forget that if you did find it useful, it would be wonderful if you could give the video a like and perhaps share it with someone else who also finds it difficult to understand native English speakers.